My name is Akwesi Edu, and I head Trust Africa, which has been mentioned a few times here. It's a foundation based in Senegal and has offices in a few places. Uh, I'm going to be the moderator for this session, which is the last session. And we've got two fantastic, a brother and a sister here. Um, don't worry about the color of the skin. Um, and the subject is philanthropy, advocacy, and support for a rights-based society. Now, it's a very long title, and so we need to reduce it to something very simple and memorable. And I think the two key words there are rights-based society. And behind those two words are what I'll call the key words of movement and advocacy. And I want to start with a very short, very brief little story, personal story. Sometime, I think it was 1982, I was teaching at the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. I'm not Tanzanian, I'm from Ghana. But I was teaching there. And a group of us, non-Tanzanian lecturers and professors at the university who were very radical, uh, got together. This was about the anti-apartheid movement. And we got together and asked for an audience with Mwalimu Nyerere. And we spoke and talked and, you know, Mwalimu, and how should we go about it and the struggle? And he laughed and he said, you remind me of the baby millipede that has just been born. And he says, mama, mama, which foot should I move first? And the mama said, baby, just mobilize every single foot you have. Mobilize them, organize them, and make sure they all move in tandem. And then you move. You go from A to B. And when I was called and asked to moderate this session, that anecdote came to mind. And the, the, the rationale of it, the lesson of that story, is that everything, whether it's health, whether it's education, you know, whatever it is we are concerned about as philanthropists or philanthropy professionals, at the end of the day, the environment, the system, the structures, really count for everything. And in Africa, it comes down to having rights-based societies. Societies that um, highlight, prioritize issues of accountability, of transparency, of equity, of opportunity for everyone, for innovation, this morning we heard a lot from some of the speakers about these things and how vital they are if indeed Africa is going to move forward <coughs> and everybody is going to realize their full potential. It also, I think, raises the issue of patriarchy. We heard a bit about it today. And also gerontocracy, the rule of the older especially men. And the strategies, and I'll end on this note and then introduce uh, uh, distinguished speakers. The strategies go from A to Z. Of course, the first is advocacy and alliance building, movement building. Somebody has got to mobilize, and those mobilized got to speak out and hold those who have power and resources to account, the government, the private sector, even the civil society sector. It also means that we must pay a lot more attention, and this has come up strategically, to peer learning and sharing. And I think this is really what this forum is about. And knowledge building. We need to know what's happening, how the field is shifting, what's new, 
how the future looks like, what's on the horizon, and how we can be innovative in the field that we are all in, which is philanthropy, either as professionals in the field or as philanthropists. So that sort of frames this session. And as I said, we've got two great people here who have incredible experience, many, many, many years of experience, and lots of insights. And uh, unfortunately, the third person, uh, Delhi, couldn't make it. But the two colleagues who made it here, David Lewis, who is on my far left, is the executive director of uh, Corruption Watch. For to most of us, David doesn't need introduction. He's done it all from A to Z. For uh, lack of time, I'm not going to go into details. You'll find his bio in the uh, booklet that we've been given. The second person is Sipo. Sipo Moyo is the Africa director at One, uh, the One campaign. And I'm sure you all know about it. It's linked somehow originally to Bono, I think. And uh, they do great work. So I'm going to start with them. And the conversation here, up here, is going to be quite brief. Because what we want is to have a conversation and you dialoguing with them. And I'm going to stop talking. My role will be a timekeeper. Just call on people, and then they will be responding. So we'll go slightly different from the way it's been since morning. Uh, let me start with you, uh, Sipu. And because you are closest to me. So, David, we'll come to you. Um, you know, the, the strategy of advocacy is a very, uh, it's a very appealing one, and it's a very important one. But it's also um, one that is not easy to, to employ, and definitely not easy to track in terms of its outcomes. How do you do it at the one campaign? So my, you know, what appealed to me was the idea that we could take that model you know, of holding leaders accountable and customize it and fit it to the African setting, knowing full well the sort of relationship between government and civil society on the African continent and how shaky and you know, that can be. Um, and of course, I was coming from a privileged background where uh, you know, I was uh, ADB res rep in Tanzania and before that in Nigeria. So I had sort of the experience of working with African governments and I know that the last thing you want to do is to irritate government. So, but you, know, you can still you know, be firm, hold them to account and you know, uh, do the right thing and do what needs to be done. So that for me was really interesting. And um, so let me just illustrate maybe by talking about one particular campaign that we've been sort of following for the last 18 months, which is the agriculture campaign. Earlier on, I heard a few people mentioning the year of agriculture as declared by the African Union. Uh, the best kept secret is that uh, we mobilized uh, African citizens to sign the petition that went to the African Union. Uh, in response to which the chair then, uh, President Yayi Boni of uh, Benin, received the petition and walked straight into the opening of the AU summit mm. and declared that 2014 would be the year of agriculture. Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so really our focus, Talk of is, impact. our focus is really about influencing policy change to the extent that it has an impact on poverty reduction. And one thing that we don't do is ask leaders to do anything new. We don't ask them to make new commitments. We basically track their commitments and follow them on that and hold them to account and say, you promised, you know, so for agriculture, for example, it's the Maputo commitment in 2003, where they said they would uh, uh, allocate 10% of their national budgets to agriculture. Um, I just then taken this job from Tanzania and, you know, when I was in Tanzania, I, you know, had the privilege of observing President Kikwete with his leadership on the Kilimo Kwanza uh, sort of initiative, which in Swahili means agriculture first. And for me, there was no doubt in my mind, just knowing that 70% of our people rely on agriculture for their livelihood, looking at the demographic, demographic shift on the African continent, uh, and the question is, where are the jobs going to come from? Not everyone wants to be a farmer, but there's a whole value chain that can be developed there, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, it's got the greatest potential for inclusive growth and shared prosperity. 
So I thought agriculture, that's exactly what we want to be doing. We have other areas we work on health, uh, transparency and accountability, particularly around extractives, meaning oil, gas, and minerals. Um, but agriculture was the thing that I really wanted to focus on. So in spite of President Kikweta's you know, sort of leadership in agriculture and his genuine interest and commitment to agriculture, the budget for Tanzania wasn't matching Maputo. Mm. And Maputo was 2003, this is 11 years on. By the time you know, we were sort of pushing him was three years ago, so it was still about eight years on. And the budget wasn't matching. So I found myself in a way you know, just constantly you know, following him around, you know, around the country and around the world <laughs> and trying to really sort of make him understand that this is important, he needs to put his money where his mouth is. Um, and I guess to test the model, you know, uh, I thought, we're going to petition this guy, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so we had a conversation with him. Uh, and what is important for me, uh, given that I am sort of working off a model that's been tried and tested, uh, but is not, you know, uh, very much sort of, uh, uh, hasn't really got that much experience on the continent, what was important for me was to bring others along. Right. That's really important, because the way I see my role as, head, as the head of one in Africa is I see myself as a public good. You know, being able to convene like-minded organizations um, and sort of build the, the capacity for lobbying, you know, at the high level and so on and so forth. So that, you know, uh, we're not necessarily irritating the governments, but we are holding them to account. And they know that they have to keep their commitments. So we worked with a number of like-minded organizations in Tanzania, particularly, uh, you know, agricultural uh, agriculture and farmers associations and so on. And um, in the end, what we did really, this was our test case in a sense. And the thing about African leaders is that you also need to assure them that you're not gonna let anything bad happen to them. Mm -hmm. Otherwise something bad will happen to you. Right. So, <laughs> right. so you, need, you need to have that assurance that you know, nothing bad is gonna happen to them. But also more importantly, they need, you need to make them appreciate that this is actually good for, this, for the country, mm -hmm. but even better for them. You know, from a legacy point of view, from, you know, and all of that from an influence point of view, uh, from just keeping their commitments point of view that at the end of the day, they're going to look it's good for them. better and the citizens are going to be happy. So it's, it's a win-win all around. So, you know, thankfully, he sort of agreed to this experiment. Uh, we cool. mobilized 17,000 signatures, uh, pressuring him to keep his commitment to the budget. Um, we marched on State House. Literally, uh, we had 100 farmers marching on State House, uh, you know, local farmers, local organizations, and a few from uh, around the continent. Um, we invited African ambassadors who were based in Dar es Salaam to Tanzania so that they could be witness to this and take the message to the African oh. Union, home and to the AU. Um, and uh, it was very, it was really very, very inspiring because, you know, he received us really graciously. Um, and in response to receiving that petition, he committed to increase the budget to 10% over the next two years. Right. Uh, he committed to do so in a transparent way, which is something we were asking for. And he's, he committed to some very sort of specific you know, policy uh, interventions in terms of quality that really impact the people we care about. Um, and indeed, in the next budget cycle, Tanzania went from 7% to 9%. Oh, wow. We're still below the 10, but they are, yes, they are close. but right? big job. Okay. I mean, um, I have a follow-up question for you, but I think I'll move to David. But let me tell you the question, and then when okay. we come back, if you have time. You know, there, there is a Latin saying, um, which I'll say in Latin and translate, uh, that uh, non solum bonus vidiaris set cease, uh, which means uh, you must not only do good, you must also look good. And, so my question to you is, how do you do all this tough work of holding government's feet to the table and literally you know, kind of scaring them, but also mm -hmm. be able to build, um, attract people to that campaign and get? But David, I mean, um, this word that Sipo has described is vital. The big question is, how do you how do you rally the philanthropic community? How do, how do you get philanthropists around it? And earlier uh, this afternoon, I heard you mention something about a wholesale, some wholesale. Could you say a few words about 
the philanthropic end of this, of this. Uh, yeah, oh, that's very loud. I'll, I'll, I'll say something briefly about that, and then, and then, uh, and then try and address your your question about how to mobilize philanthropists around it. This isn't the the idea of this foundation, this wholesale foundation, is to um, basically access resources that would not otherwise go into funding social justice institutions like our own, rights-based uh, advocates in, in, in effect. And the idea is simply that there are a large number of people with large numbers of resources, but that are not necessarily great enough on their own, or they don't have the inclination to set up their own infrastructures to make grants and monitor grants and do all the kind of heavy lifting that is required in the, in the grant making arena. And so um, this will wholesale the, 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 the proceeds, if you like, from that solicitation to institutions that are already set up and established and have the infrastructure to do it. The test will be whether, whether we can persuade and whether we can gather together a credible enough group of ambassadors in that field, persuade people with resources to part for those, with those resources for social justice. Because I think that the experience, and this you know, in some sense goes to answering the second question, the experience with people who have money to give away, um, particularly if they have a profile or their business connections have a, have a profile, is to give it to building schools, building clinics, putting down brick and mortar that is incontrovertibly good. They're a little um, more reluctant to, to contribute to institutions that, you know, as Sipo has just described, and I could say the same about myself, have an ineluctably political dimension to them. Mobilizing people, mobilizing signatures, organizing marches right. are generally not the kind of things that, uh, that, uh, um, right. that people with resources like to part with. And, and they feel understandably nervous about, about doing so. I think that the, the, answer, for, the answer to it is to, is to persuade them that they get much more bang for their philanthropic buck out of strengthening institutions than they do out of adding a little bit to the national health budget or the national education budget. And if they don't improve institutions, what they add to the national health budget and to the national education budget, particularly in the context of high levels of corruption or state incapacity, will get frittered away in the same way that the health budget and the education budget currently get frittered away. And so far from being a, a, a safe uh, way of granting money, it's generally a pretty ineffectual way of granting money. I think there are very few foundations that have the scale to actually make a difference to a health budget or an education budget. And certainly not in a middle income developing country like South Africa do they have much capacity to make an impact on the quantum of resources that are provided. But by working on the institutional quality of the society, they do have an ability to improve the, the manner in which resources are, are spent the efficiency with which they are spent, and the, the equity with which they are spent. And the only way in which those institutions, which are generally public sector institutions, can be made more effective and more equitable and more efficient is by supporting institutions that hold them accountable. The, 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 the reason why they're, why they're ineffective and inequitable and inefficient is because, effect, because essentially their consumers are not sufficiently demanding or not sufficiently well organized to be demanding. They don't have voice, they don't have the platforms on which to, to exercise that voice. And so institutions like the, the, the one that I'm working for, and from what I understand from what, 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 what Sipo has said, the, the, the kind of institution she's working for, attempt to provide, I suppose, the encouragement and the platforms to give voice to to consumers of public, of public services, which are the citizenry or the members of the public of any, of any given country. And as I've said, the, 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 the pitch is that this will be a far more effective way of, right. of, of dealing with, of, of spending your resources 
then building a school here and building a school there that you will go back to in five years' time mm -hmm. and see has gone down the, 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 the same black hole that yeah. many other public resources have gone down because the quality of the institutions that manage them is, is as poor as it is. Yeah, well, I mean, I think um, if I had money to give, you've made a, a strong case for supporting institutions. But back to the movement building, you know, this social movement approach, which Sipo talked about, where you're getting, what, 17,000 signatures and you're doing the march and so on. How do you build a constituency for that? Back to my... Great. Um, I did want to make a comment on something on what David was just talking about, to essentially to the distinguished uh, philanthropists in the house. Uh, I'm excited about this because I'm particularly excited about African philanthropists because it's really about them beginning to drive the agenda. You know, that, that, that's what I find really exciting about it. You know, it's the whole sort of ownership, you know, and in the model that I'm talking about in the way that we're working at one, you know, it's a tried and tested model that, you know, we're working with African civil society organizations, uh, getting African leaders who are clear champions to champion particular causes, build the neighborhood effect, talk to their friends and their brothers and their neighbors. Uh, we're working with African celebrities. Uh, we found that African leaders like to take pictures with Yaya Toure <laughs> and Dibanj, you know, so it's great. So we're working with everybody, you know, the entire sort of coalition of forces for good. You know, we're working with the private sector, uh, just bringing everybody to the table. But for me, it's this ownership thing that's really important to me. That's what I care about, is giving Africans the voice, the platform, uh, and in a sense, you know, the ownership and the power to, to drive the agenda for Africa's development. Um, so, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, you got me excited in the head. In a way, you're saying or you're implying that there are some things African philanthropy and African philanthropists could do better than foreign donor agencies. Is that, is I, that I'm, an I'm saying there's a huge opportunity and role right. for African philanthropists, absolutely. Uh, I'm convinced about issues. that, yes, and in the interest of public disclosure, we are talking to African philanthropists, a couple of them have written checks for us, and I'm really excited about that because they're more engaged on the issues, they begin to care more, uh, and it, it's no longer just a donor issue. There's a role for everybody, but I'm saying uh, it's, there's never been a better time yeah. for African philanthropists to come to the table and really own and drive the agenda. And drive this. Yeah, and I'm excited by what uh, you know the Masiwas are doing, uh, you know, in Zimbabwe and all over Africa. Yeah. You know, uh, Mr. James Mwangi, who's sitting here. You know, there's a whole lot of them. You know, uh, Ali Kodangote, who's not here. You know, with for polio and so on. So I'm excited about it. Uh, I think it's uh, just about time uh, to engage African philanthropists. And uh, you know, like we said, it's 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 really about um, you know, I come from a background where I spent, you know, 18 years before coming to, 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 to one, uh, you know, building schools, hospitals, roads, bridges, right. and so on. And I know the impact of exactly how many kids are going to go to that. But change is much more effective. Yeah. You know, the I mean, uh, you inspired me this morning, by the way. So, um, yes. So, <laughs> when I dip my hand in my pocket, if it goes, it doesn't go too deep. But, I mean, David. Um, and I do want to say what, mm, that it is not easy. It, oh, so I can imagine. Let yeah. no one underestimate it. It's, but it's extremely difficult. I mean, the civil society space on the African continent is a discussion for another day. That, you know? That's my question to David. I mean, David, what's your nightmare? Or rather, what, what are the opportunities you see that you wish you could grasp? You know, at, at Corruption Watch, as, as you, you build bridges to the philanthropic community. As it relates to the philanthropic community. Yes. Um, oh, whichever. Well, you know, our, our, our model is, is, is a model of facilitating, encouraging and facilitating public participation in, in, in talking about philanthropy, both in, it's talking about corruption, both in, in, in uh, the volume of the conversation, if you like, and in the, the quality of the conversation. 
and the, the, the form by which we, we, we do it is to encourage people to report experiences of corruption. So in, in two years, we've had 6,000 reports on a variety of platforms that we, we provide in order for people to be able to talk to us. And the idea is to talk back to them. So whatever it is that we do, and there are a variety of ways in which these reports are, are treated, whatever we do, we talk back to them so that they know that there is a, a dialogue going. This is not just another hotline into which, into which things are, are, are falling. There's an intense di dialogue going. And the dialogue is what encourages more people to report uh, experiences of corruption. And it's, a, it's at times a two-way dialogue between us and the public. And whenever we can, we involve the authorities, as it were, in that dialogue in order to, in order to hold them accountable. I mean, what I, what I would like to see with respect to philanthropists, apart from more money, but, but is, is the, you know, there, there are a number of things. You know, the, the, the one, I know that this word partnership is a real weasel word often, but I think it really requires a partnership between the, the, the grant-making institutions and the grant-receiving right. institutions. This is not something that you, and, and our, our funders, and you know, we have a budget of about $2 million a year, and no single funder, and this is part of the policy, is responsible for more than about 10% of that, of that budget. Um, it requires an extremely close engagement with them. Some of our funders are very closely engaged. Others you don't hear from between grant-making cycles, mm. and it's extremely threatening. It's an extremely mm. insecure way to live with those funders who, who, who work with us in that way. I would prefer a demanding, sometimes pain-in-the-butt sort of funder, but one who is there, and there are no surprises. You know what's coming. You know when they're satisfied with what you're doing. You know when they're dissatisfied. You know what their own policies are. Secondly, I think that there's a real, real requirement on the part of the funders and on the part of the institutions to do really serious monitoring and evaluation work because it, it's difficult to work out precisely what the impact is. It's not always possible to show the impact in as clear a way as, as Sipo showed in that experience. So you really want to know if you've got slender resources, you don't want to spend too much time, and you're doing very experimental work, you don't want to spend too much time going up dead blind alleys. So you, you know, where, when initially we started and funders started to talk about monitoring and evaluation, I thought this was a real funder's preoccupation. I soon began to realize that, in fact, it was a preoccupation that we had to seriously take on to the extent that we have now hired somebody who does nothing else but monitor and evaluate what we do. And yeah. I guess the third thing, and, and if I could just say, say finally, the third thing is this whole question of, of, of scale. I, I, I think this is really something that has to be confronted. I, I've been in NGO work for the last two years. Prior to that, I was in government. And prior to that, in the, in the trade union movement. And the most striking thing about, for me about being in the NGO world is how many really good people are doing really good things um, uh, with huge uh, uh, volumes of commitment to doing it, but are just not operating at a scale sufficient to make a difference. And if I could suggest maybe, maybe a topic for discussion, which sticks in the throat of a kind of human rights advocate a bit, and I'm sure will in your throats as well, I think that funders have to start picking winners. Uh, they, they have to start identifying small numbers, smaller numbers of organizations that they think can make a real difference and making, taking a heavy bet on them succeeding. Because I think that this, this notion of sprinkling large amounts of money over huge numbers of organizations is no good for anybody, not for the grant makers, not for the grant receivers. And it's something, you know, I realize as I say that, we may land up in an organization that doesn't get made a bet on. But then we'd have to go and work for those who did get made a bet on. But there really is a very good argument for saying that uh, Funding has to be scaled up in order to enable the, the institutions themselves to, to, to okay. scale up and make impact. I'm sure that uh, that's very thought-provoking. We need to open it up. And on that note, really, I have tons of questions. But I think 
let's harness what you've got here. First, you just, we do what we've been doing before, which is you mention your name, if you've, even if you've said it before. And then, so we take you first. Yes, yes. Sorry, I, I don't know the names yet. Yeah, but. That's fine. Shari Berenbach from the U.S. Africa Development Foundation. I thought this was a fabulous presentation, and I only wish I can turn to my trustees and my, my board of directors to ask them to focus more on policy, because I think it really can be very, very pivotal, and it's something that philanthropy in the United States has played a very important role for many years. And I just wanted to point out something that many people don't even realize, um, that in the U.S. civil rights movement, I once heard uh, John Lewis, uh, the, the, who's now a congressman, but was very active in the early days of civil rights. And he, he got up at a convening of, of U.S. philanthropy and, and mentioned how the Babcock Foundation had funded the original um, the voter rights campaigns that took place in the South in the U.S. in the early 60s that were absolutely instrumental for many, for really the creating the kind of civil rights change that we later saw in the United States. And it took philanthropy to do that. And philanthropy, because it's really part of civil society, has much more latitude. And, the, and once again, the smaller amounts can have such big impact. Um, I, I find this presentation quite compelling and something that I'm hoping others are inspired by as well. So you see, the revolution can be funded. Um, did I see it? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Henry Senkasi from Site Servers. Um, thank you, Sofo and uh, Sifo and uh, David, for the uh, wonderful presentations. Um, when I was listening to Sifo, I kept wondering um, you've had some bit of achievement in terms of um, changing campaign policies and other things. And, um, um, I kept wondering whether you actually go beyond uh, just you know uh, looking at policy change or increasing resources to uh, funding some sectors uh, like the one you mentioned from seven to nine percent. Do you go beyond that in terms of uh, uh, looking at how much of that actually does the beneficiary receive, knowing the African governments and how resources are utilized in Africa? And, and probably that could be the, maybe the work of David. And, and, and I find this a very uh, interesting combination of, of panelists. So do you go beyond that in terms of reassessing how much of that? We could sit here and clap for the increase, but um, how much of that actually is utilized or, or does the beneficiary receive? Um, my last one is on um, um, inclusiveness. How do you ensure in your campaigns um, uh, you, your campaigns are inclusive. Uh, take, you know, policies are inclusive. The campaigns are inclusive, especially uh, if you look at the disabled uh, community. Thank you. Um, so yes, we do go beyond that. I mean, what happened is that the initial commitments, you know, whether it was the Abuja commitment for health or the Maputo commitment for agriculture or the Dakar commitment for education, they were focused on the quantum. They were about the percentages, 10%, 12%, 15%, 20%, and mm. so on. Uh, and I said earlier that we don't ask leaders to make new commitments. We just follow the commitments that they've made. But what is exciting for me about the Year of Agriculture, which in a sense came about as a result of 40,000 Africans signing a petition, what's exciting for us is that we have an opportunity to draft a declaration, or at least to work with the African leaders in, in, in drafting the declaration for the June summit which is even much better than the Maputo Declaration. So it's go, it talks about, first of all, we want a recommitment to the 10%. That's not going away. Uh, then secondly, it's about the quality issues. You know, what exactly is the 10% going to? You know, clearly, we don't want it going to training and per diem. You know, is it really targeting the people we care about, the smallholder farmers, the extension services, the infrastructure, the inputs, and so on and so forth? And thirdly, and most importantly, is the transparency of those budgets. Mm. That way, citizens, and most importantly, the farmers, can follow the money and see exactly what the money is going to and can hold their leaders to account. So great question, really important. So it's not just about the public investment, it's about the smart policy interventions that underpin the public investments. Okay, David. You know, you know I think that there, there are two ways of, of, of advocating for, for reform or, or change, and they're not mutually exclusive. In fact, they're complementary. The one is through expert 
the work of experts. So, so these are people who know about laws and who know about economics and who know about all those sorts of things. And they're, they're scholars, activist scholars, or policy scholars who are proposing change. The, 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 and I, I think it's a necessary condition for change, but it's absolutely insufficient. The other, the other model is one that, that relies on, if you like, the authenticity of a publicly acknowledged constituency for, for the change. And that's really the, 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 the business that, that, that we're in. And to some extent, I understand the business to be that Sip was in from what I heard, from what her, I, I heard her saying. So there's no such thing as just policy uh, change. You've got to mobilize a constituency in order to support that policy change. And once the constituency has been mobilized, you've got to then use that constituency to hold, keep government honest and basically implement the policies and implement them effectively. It, it is, and I say that without understating the challenge involved in keeping uh, this constituency mobilized. For, for our part, um, and this is by no means the only model, I mean, we, we are making quite a heavy bet, which, which is not necessarily, which is greeted with some skepticism by our, our sisters and brothers in the, in the NGO world on, on technology, on communications technology, which we think is going to be an effective way of keeping the, the public that are supporting us mobilized, but we have to be talking to them all the time. We have to be using this technology to build communities. We, we have to be pumping real content into that communication because you can't rely on sheer spin and, and sort of agitprop alone. There has to be real content. And the content basic mostly has to go towards educating people as to what their rights are and what their rights could be so that they are able to exercise those rights without our, our intervention. I mean, that obviously is the ideal state to which one wants to aspire, where there's an, a citizenry that are not only active and demanding, but that they know what their rights are, are to demand. And so that's our model. But it, you know, the continuum is from policy changes to marches in the, in the street to petitions. But I think you have to be operating along the entire continuum in order to make uh, policy change ef ef effective and, and, and desirable. OK. I don't see any hands. So what I'm going to suggest is you ask the audience questions. <laughs> Simple. I see what, a couple of hands. Question? We've been oh. saved by a few. You see yeah. that? I, now know, I now know how to stimulate questions. Yes. Uh, uh, I'm Patrick A. Wapp, Patrick. president of Ashesi University. And I have a question around, uh, you know, advocacy for the government, um, this question of scale, um, and really focusing on pursuing scale and some of the dangers in that, right? So um, first, very quick, just last week, I read a report of a study done in Ghana with third grade and sixth grade kids on literacy. And the results are absolutely shocking. Over 50% cannot read in any language. 40% can read without comprehension. 4% can read with comprehension. Now, this is a disaster, yeah. right? And, and it, it raises the question, how has this happened? How has, have things got so bad? Now, I know that for the last 10 years, 15 years, we've all been patting ourselves on the shoulder saying, we've got kids in school. Because the metrics that we set for governments is get kids in school or spend X percentage of your budget on education. And these are very surface metrics. And you can end up scaling a really bad thing, right? And this is the thing about scale. You want to scale good things and what works, but you really want to avoid scaling 
yeah. dysfunction. Yeah. And I worry that sometimes when we focus so much on scale, we end up scaling dysfunction. And the flip side to this question is to say, look, if we were to take all the, uh, the small projects that are doing work, important work, like the fistula work we just heard about uh, earlier today, and said, well, because this thing is not at scale, we're not going to fund it. And you did that to every small project in Africa. What would happen? I think disaster. So I just want to you know, ask this question about how do you make sure that we scale what works and do not scale dysfunction? And how do we make sure we don't uh, take dramatic steps that might actually cause harm? Very thought-provoking question, the pitfalls of uh, senseless scaling. Yes, we take uh, Rita and then we come to you. After. So, uh, Rita Roy with the MasterCard and Foundation. So, I'm going to build on Patrick's question, and my question is really about accountability. One of the things I'm very aware of, certainly in the United States, is that there's a lot of large private dollars which push special interests. Um, and so, some of that special interests, certainly for very, very good causes around anti corruption, higher education, <coughs> better budgets, etc. But how do we deal with this issue of accountability? We are not elected. Uh, what, how do we ensure transparency that those who are watching government are themselves accountable and themselves transparent uh, in, in their dealings and, and are able to report results? Another very important question. Are you ready for us? Um, uh, science, mathematician. No, no, actually, I dropped out. So <laughs> You don't sound like one. <laughs> Um, uh, thank you very much. I, I, as I said, I'm from Kakisu Trust. Um, you see, when you support social justice causes and bring in issues of accountability, especially looking at governments, uh, one, sometimes there are assumptions which are not true. They are false. Um, and some of the assumptions may actually be that these governments have the will to do certain things, they just don't want to do them. Sometimes they also don't even know how to achieve what they've set up to achieve. So um, while I'm very uh, excited about supporting social justice, you know, I'm from an NGO that is sustainable. We don't ask money from anybody. We don't need it. So we can actually get into social justice support if we think it is the most effective. But what we have realized is very effective. It's really to have a model of collaboration with government. If I give you an example of what we did, for instance, we would say, at the moment we're running it, I'll be very quick, we're running a big program in the Free State Department. We know there's a lot of talk about corruption and uh, poor delivery of services. So we went to government and said to them, we're putting in together with our partners 200 million rand. Put in your 200 million rand. We think we can support uh, curriculum development, school development, and deliver infrastructure without corruption and at the most cost-effective way. And I can tell you the results have been amazing. We're building schools at one third of what the government can build. And they're beginning now to say, it looks like we do need to have this kind of partnership. And you know, when we think about, for instance, say, the kind of relationship that exists between unions and the bosses in many African countries and maybe in other Western countries, I always think about what I've been told about the relationship that exists in Germany, that the way they collaborate in terms of uh, working together, they're actually able to deliver more. So I'm just wondering whether the social justice agenda should not be linked in trying to pursue government to really work much more closely with NGOs 
who are able to deliver what sometimes we think government does not want to deliver, but maybe they cannot deliver. Thank you. Yes. Njanja uh, from Holland Foundation again. Just to, my question also links to Patrick and, and Rita. Yeah. On, on scaling up and the, the need for determining social dividends because, before we go on scale. Because I think most of the time what works or uh, is not working, it needs to be quantifiable in order for philanthropists to direct or redirect their resources to something that they know if it goes on scale, these are the dividends that we are going to get. But one of the challenges where we find working models is how do we quantify social dividends? Can somebody share those experiences of quantifying social dividends in order to uh, work on scaling some things that works with something that we know what the outcomes will be for, for anybody who invests in that sector? Thank you. Um, just to, I won't repeat the questions, but the obsession with scaling. Um, an obsession. Advocacy and accountability, uh, collaboration with governments, and then uh, quantification of social dividends. Um, okay. Any of you, very briefly, I'm checking okay, the maybe time I'll to make sure. Speak quickly about um, accountability, mutual accountability. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. It's very important for civil society to remain accountable uh, because if civil society is not accountable, uh, then you know that we've lost the plot. So it's very important for us to be held accountable as well. Uh, then on um, partnership with government, I think that's the whole point: is for government and civil society to realize the potential, uh, you know, achieve you know, the potential of what they can achieve by working together. So that's also very, very important. I think partnership with, and I think there is a growing realization and awareness for that part, uh, partnership. So it's not just the public, the private, it's the people, and it's the civil society, you know, which is the people. So that kind of partnership is very important. Um, and that's why I think increasingly we need to demystify, you know, sort of, for lack of a better word, this relationship between government and civil society, it doesn't have to be combative or confrontational mm -hmm. and so on. It, it can actually be a very effective and production, a productive uh, relationship between government and civil society. So couldn't agree more. Uh, in fact, it is the point of, it's, it's the whole point. And then um, I think Patrick, uh, your question was actually very good about making sure that we're not scaling the bad. Um, it's really, a, and that's why I'm very excited about sort of the, the direction in which we're moving. It's also about keeping an eye on the outcomes, you know, so you're not just scaling things for the sake of scaling. It's about keeping an eye on the outcomes. Um, it's also about, in a way, scaling or amplifying our partnerships with like-minded organizations so that we're not all operating in silos. As long as we care about the same issues, why don't we work together, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so. That's something I thought David might want to say some words about the scaling thing. But anyway, yeah. go for whichever. Yeah, you know, the, the, the scaling thing, I, I, I shouldn't be misunderstood here. The scaling thing is not an anti-small project position. You know, I, in, in, in anti-corruption work um, and, and social justice work generally, I can tell you Transparency International, a big multilateral institution, is, is working at below minimum efficient scale. Corruption Watch, uh, a South African institution, is operating at below minimum efficient scale. A lowly advice office in the rural areas of South Africa is working at below minimum efficient scale. All of these institutions are working at below minim min minimum efficient scale. And there's an argument for scaling up institutions at every, at every level, um, but not all of them. So, it, but it's not an argument for saying that there should be one center that is exclusively focused and is the exclusive recipient of funds for improving the healthcare system or, or, or combating corruption. And to say, secondly, that there are ways of scaling up and there are ways of scaling up. One is to pour money and resources into one institution. The other is for grant makers to make their grants in a complementary fashion and to effectively scale up by ensuring that they make their grants in a manner in which their grantees 
effectively complement each other and collaborate with each other. In some ways, the Open Society Foundation, on a global scale, is a representation of, of that kind of network of, 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 of institutions. And in South Africa, you know, the one, one of our most active funders, the, the Wraith Foundation, effectively does that as well. So we're scaled up because when we enter a school's campaign on corruption, as we have done, because we've received a lot of reports about corruption at schools, we can work together with another Wraith grantee, which is focused on the education system. We are not focused on the education system, we're focused on corruption, but we have a complementary, we have a complementary uh, uh, relationship to each other. Um, you know, on the question of accountability and not being elected, I mean, at the risk of saying something that will be construed as really silly and provocative, you, you, you have to be really careful about, about um, over-privileging the whole question of being elected and being not elected. I mean, I think there's a real crisis of political parties. You know, an elected president was thrown out in Egypt. An elected president has just been run out of, out of the Ukraine. The, the two United States parties and the electoral system in the United States don't sound to me like good examples of, of representative democracy in fashion. And so I think that there are, are civil society organizations that can be representative by virtue of their ability to mobilize a community behind a particular set of demands. So, you know, the elected government of South Africa for many years refused to provide ARV treatment because the president had some bizarre idea about what caused, what, 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 what caused the HIV virus, but civil society mobilized and held him, held the government accountable by virtue of their demonstrated ability to mobilize the community. So I wouldn't be too hung up about having to be elected in order to insist that you nevertheless are representative of a, of a public voice that is not being well served by the elected government and their, and their elected representative. Okay. And, and to just say finally that on working with government, I think that this is, this is, the, this is the object of the exercise in some sense, where there is a, a, a democratic government to be held to account. I mean, one of our most gratifying experiences is that, you know, we've been greeted with a lot of hostility by elements in government, from ministers down to, down to lowly officials, but we've also, in the process of doing what we are doing, we've also sort of winkled out the most amazingly gratifying and affirming support from within government, who, who need us. You know, sometimes the mighty treasury needs a lowly, uh, a civil society organization in order to hold a, a powerful mayor to account that the treasury can't hold to account because it's politically difficult for the treasury to hold to account somebody who's quite as powerful as the mayor of a large uh, South African metro. So there, there are ways in working with government that are, are, are both open and acknowledged and that are just simply complementary and, and mutually um, facilitating. And as I say, the most gratifying aspect of, of, of doing what we're doing is actually seeing how many public servants, both senior and junior, are, are, are sort of rooting for us, so much so that the, the significant majority of the reports we get about corruption are coming from mid-level and senior level public servants. Okay. Well, I, uh, time is running out. We need to wrap up now. Let me just uh, first, the, I think the question on how do you quantify social dividends wasn't quite addressed. Uh, it's, some, it's food for thought. I think we all sleep over it and think about it. I, I can only say what Einstein, um, Albert Einstein once said, that not everything that counts can be counted, <laughs> and not everything that can be counted counts. But that's kind of seeking an alibi, because I think the question is more profound than uh, citing a quote. Um, there are two takeaway points for me, and things, not uh, answers or solutions, but things for us all to think about. And the first is that there's a need, there's an opportunity, there's space, there's justification for African philanthropy to take up advocacy work. 
and to take up the broader issues of policies and social justice and all the stuff you've heard, in addition to, not in place of, providing direct support to individuals and local level uh, work and so on. And the second, uh, and, and the case for it, I think we've made a good, I mean, I heard you and, you know, I, I would say you've made a good case for it, but it still needs to be refined, it still needs to be proven, and it still needs, we, need, we still have some persuasion to do. Uh, the second takeaway point for me is that we need to be careful. We need to be careful about scaling. The obsession with scaling can lead us the wrong way. We need to be careful about uh, accountability issues. Uh, for whom are we speaking? What's our transparency? And I hear you, David. Uh, I think your response was good, but uh, it's not a question of election, but you know, the constituency we represent and how we reflect the broader um, public good is something that we constantly have to think about. We can never take it for granted, and we should never assume that simply because we, th we say we are doing good, we, um, we have justification. Okay, so thank you, and uh, thank you for staying on. Oh.